Well, hello there, and welcome to day six of the 12 Days of Craftlet. Today, I have a treat for you. Today, we have a Christmas story called Christmas Storms and Sunshine. It was written in 1848 by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Mrs. Gaskell. That's how she wanted to be put in her byline, and that's how people referred to her for the longest time. She lived from 1810 to 1865 not long enough. But she was known as a biographer and a novelist and a short story writer. This that we're going to listen to is kind of a novella. One of the things that got her very famous historically is that she's the person who wrote the not entirely true biography of Charlotte Bronte. If you want a more accurate biography of not just Charlotte Bronte, but all of the Brontes, uh, take a look at the book that we've linked to in the show notes. I've forgotten the name right now. And you'll see a picture of the cover right here if you're watching on YouTube. So one of the reasons that I really have loved Elizabeth Gaskell is because when we did North and South, I found her moralizing to be light and her sense of justice to be strong, but not not pushy. She's a little ironic. She was also writing what was considered a problem of England story, uh, where there was an actual societal problem. And she she had a solution. And that's what North and South is about. I think many of us said while we were listening to North and South on Craftlet that that is the book that really should have been called Pride and Prejudice, because that's exactly what she was focusing on. So here, she's going to use Christmas as kind of a playground to let her take on different problems, um, it's smaller problems, interpersonal problems like rivalry and jealousy. And then she, because she's Mrs. Gaskell, brings it around at the end and focuses on the importance of reconciliation and being a good neighbor, and ultimately, the important power of Christmas goodwill is the season. Let's listen to Storms and Sunshine by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Christmas Storms and Sunshine by Mrs. Gaskell In the town of no matter where, there circulated two local newspapers, no matter when. Now, the Flying Post was long established and respectable, alias bigoted and Tory, The examiner was spirited and intelligent, alias new-fangled and democratic. Every week these newspapers contained articles abusing each other, as cross and peppery as articles could be, and evidently the production of irritated minds, although they seemed to have one stereotyped commencement. Though the article appearing in last week's post or examiner, is below contempt, yet we have been induced, etc., etc. And every Saturday the radical shopkeepers shook hands together, and agreed that the post was done for by the slashing, clever examiner, while the more dignified Tories began by regretting that Johnson should think that low paper, only read by a few of the vulgar, worth wasting his wit upon, however the examiner was at its last gasp. It was not, though. It lived and flourished, at least it paid its way, as one of the heroes of my story could tell. He was chief compositor, or whatever title may be given to the head man of the mechanical part of a newspaper. He hardly confined himself to that department. Once or twice, unknown to the editor, when the manuscript had fallen short, he had filled up the vacant space by compositions of his own. Announcements of a forthcoming crop of green peas in December, a grey thrush having been seen, or a white hare, or such interesting phenomena. Invented for the occasion, I must confess, but what of that? His wife always knew when to expect a little specimen of her husband's literary talent by a peculiar cough, 
which served as prelude and judging from this encouraging sign and the high-pitched and emphatic voice in which he read them she was inclined to think that an ode to an early rosebud in the corner devoted to original poetry and a letter in the correspondence department signed pro bono publico were her husband's writing and to hold up her head accordingly i never could find out what it was that occasioned the hodgsons to lodge in the same house as the jenkinses jenkins held the same office in the tory paper as hodgson did in the examiner and as i said before i leave you to give it a name but jenkins had a proper sense of his position and a proper reverence for all in authority from the king down to the editor and sub-editor he would as soon have thought of borrowing the king's crown for a nightcap or the king's sceptre for a walking-stick as he would have thought of filling up any spare corner with any production of his own and i think it would have even added to his contempt of hodgson if that were possible had he known of the productions of his brain as the latter fondly alluded to the paragraphs he inserted when speaking to his wife jenkins had his wife too wives were wanting to finish the completeness of the quarrel which existed one memorable christmas week some dozen years ago between the two neighbours the two compositors and with wives it was a very pretty a very complete quarrel to make the opposing parties still more equal still more well matched if the hodgsons had a baby such a baby a poor puny little thing mrs jenkins had a cat such a cat a great nasty meowling tom-cat that was always stealing the milk put by for little angel's supper and now having matched greek with greek i must proceed to the tug of war it was the day before christmas such a cold east wind such an inky sky such a blue-black look in people's faces as they were driven out more than usual to complete their purchases for the next day's festival before leaving home that morning jenkins had given some money to his wife to buy the next day's dinner my dear i wish for turkey and sausages it may be a weakness but i own i am partial to sausages my deceased mother was such tastes are hereditary as to the sweets whether plum pudding or mince pies i leave such considerations to you i only beg you not to mind expense christmas comes but once a year and again he had called out from the bottom of the first flight of stairs just close to the hodgson's door such ostentatiousness as mrs hodgson observed you will not forget the sausages my dear i should have liked to have had something above common mary said hodgson as they too made their plans for the next day but i think roast beef must do for us you see love we've a family only one jem i don't want more than roast beef though i'm sure before i went to service mother and me would have thought roast beef a very fine dinner well let's settle it then roast beef and a plum pudding and now good-bye mind and take care of little tom i thought he was a bit hoarse this morning and off he went to his work now it was a good while since mrs jenkins and mrs hodgson had spoken to each other although they were quite as much in possession of the knowledge of events and opinions as though they did mary knew that mrs jenkins despised her for not having a real lace cap which mrs jenkins had and for having been a servant which mrs jenkins had not and the little occasional pinchings which the hodgsons were obliged to resort to to make both ends meet 
would have been very patiently endured by Mary if she had not winced under Mrs. Jenkins' knowledge of such economy. But she had her revenge. She had a child, and Mrs. Jenkins had none. To have had a child, even such a puny baby as little Tom, Mrs. Jenkins would have worn commonest caps, and cleaned grates, and drudged her fingers to the bone. The great unspoken disappointment of her life soured her temper, and turned her thoughts inward, and made her morbid and selfish. "'Hang that cat! He's been stealing again! He's gnawed the cold mutton in his nasty mouth till it's not fit to set before a Christian, and I've nothing else for Jem's dinner. But I'll give it him now I've caught him that I will.' So saying, Mary Hodgson caught up her husband's Sunday cane, and despite Pussy's cries and scratches, she gave him such a beating as she hoped might cure him of his thievish propensities, when, lo and behold, Mrs. Jenkins stood at the door with a face of bitter wrath. "'Aren't you ashamed of yourself, ma'am, to abuse a poor dumb animal, ma'am, as knows no better than to take food when he sees it, ma'am? He only follows the nature which God has given, ma'am. And it's a pity your nature, ma'am, which I've heard is of the stingy, saving species, does not make you shut your cupboard door a little closer. There is such a thing as law for brute animals. I'll ask Mr. Jenkins, but I don't think them radicals has done away with that law yet, for all their reform bill, ma'am. My poor precious love of a Tommy, is he hurt? and is his leg broke for taking a mouthful of scraps as most people would give away to a beggar if he'd take em wound up mrs jenkins casting a contemptuous look on the remnant of a scrag end of mutton mary felt very angry and very guilty for she really pitied the poor limping animal as he crept up to his mistress and there lay down to bemoan himself she wished she had not beaten him so hard, for it certainly was her own careless way of never shutting the cupboard door that had tempted him to his fault. But the sneer at her little bit of mutton turned her penitence to fresh wrath, and she shut the door in Mrs. Jenkins's face as she stood caressing her cat in the lobby with such a bang that it wakened little Tom, and he began to cry. Everything was to go wrong with Mary today. Now Baby was awake, who was to take her husband's dinner to the office? She took the child in her arms and tried to hush him off to sleep again, and as she sung, she cried, she could hardly tell why, a sort of reaction from her violent, angry feelings. She wished she had never beaten the poor cat. She wondered if his leg was really broken. What would her mother say if she knew how cross and cruel her little Mary was getting? If she should live to beat her child in one of her angry fits? It was of no use lullabying while she sobbed, so it must be given up, and she must carry her baby in her arms and take him with her to the office, for it was long past dinner time. So she pared the mutton carefully, although by so doing she reduced the meat to an infinitesimal quantity, and taking the baked potatoes out of the oven, she popped them piping hot into her basket with the etceteras of plate, butter, salt, and knife and fork. It was indeed a bitter wind. She bent against it as she ran, and the flakes of snow were sharp and cutting as ice. Baby cried all the way, though she cuddled him up in her shawl. Then her husband had made his appetite up for a potato pie, and, literary man as he was, his body got so much the better of his mind that he looked rather black at the cold mutton. Mary had no appetite for her own dinner when she arrived at home again. So, after she had tried to feed baby, and he had fretfully refused to take his bread and milk, 
she laid him down as usual on his quilt, surrounded by playthings, while she sided away and chopped suet for the next day's pudding. Early in the afternoon a parcel came, done up first in brown paper, then in such a white, grass-bleached, sweet-smelling towel, and a note from her dear, dear mother, in which quaint writing she endeavoured to tell her daughter that she was not forgotten at Christmas time, but that learning that Farmer Burton was killing his pig, she had made interest for some of his famous pork, out of which she had manufactured some sausages, and flavoured them just as Mary used to like when she lived at home. "'Dear, dear mother,' said Mary to herself, "'there never was any one like her for remembering other folk. What rare sausages she used to make! Home things have a smack with them no bought things can ever have. Set them up with their sausages. I've a notion if Mrs. Jenkins had ever tasted mother's, she'd have no fancy for them town-made things Fanny took in just now. And so she went on thinking about home, till the smiles and the dimples came out again at the remembrance of that pretty cottage, which would look green even now in the depth of winter, with its pyracanthus and its holly-bushes, and the great Portugal laurel that was her mother's pride, and the back path through the orchard to Farmer Burton's. How well she remembered it! The bushels of unripe apples she had picked up there and distributed among his pigs, till he had scolded her for giving them so much green trash. She was interrupted. Her baby, I call him a baby because his father and mother did, and because he was so little of his age, but I rather think he was eighteen months old, had fallen asleep some time before among his playthings. An uneasy, restless sleep, but of which Mary had been thankful, as his morning's nap had been too short, and as she was so busy. But now he began to make such a strange, crowing noise, just like a chair drawn heavily and gratingly along a kitchen floor. His eyes were open, but expressive of nothing but pain. "'Mother's darling,' said Mary, in terror, lifting him up. "'Baby, try not to make that noise. Hush, hush, darling, what hurts him?' But the noise came worse and worse. "'Fanny! Fanny!' Mary called in mortal fright, for her baby was almost black with his gasping breath, and she had no one to ask for aid or sympathy but her landlady's daughter, a little girl of twelve or thirteen, who attended to the house in her mother's absence as daily cook in gentlemen's families. Fanny was more especially considered the attendant of the upstairs lodgers, who paid for the use of the kitchen, for Jenkins could not abide the smell of meat cooking. But just now she was fortunately sitting at her afternoon's work of darning stockings, and hearing Mrs. Hodgson's cry of terror, she ran to her sitting-room and understood the case at a glance. "'He's got the croup! Oh, Mrs. Hodgson, he'll die as sure as fate! Little brother had it, and he died in no time!' The doctor said he could do nothing for him. It had gone too far. He said if we'd put him in a warm bath at first it might have saved him. But bless you, he was never half so bad as your baby. Unconsciously there mingled in her statement some of a child's love of producing an effect, but the increasing danger was clear enough. Oh, my baby, my baby! Oh, love, love, don't look so ill! I cannot bear it, and my fire so low. There, I was thinking of home and picking currants and never minding the fire. Oh, Fanny, what is the fire like in the kitchen? Speak. Mother told me to screw it up and throw some slack on as soon as Mrs. Jenkins had done with it, and so I did. It's very low and black. But, oh, Mrs. Hodgson, let me run for the doctor. I cannot bear to hear him. It's so like little brother. Through her streaming tears, Mary motioned her to go, and trembling, sinking, sick at heart, 
she laid her boy in his cradle and ran to fill her kettle. Mrs. Jenkins, having cooked her husband's snug little dinner to which he came home, having told him her story of Pussy's beating, at which he was justly and dignifiedly indignant, saying it was all of a piece with that abusive examiner, having received the sausages and turkey and mince pies which her husband had ordered, and cleaned up the room and prepared everything for tea, and coaxed and duly bemoaned her cat, who had pretty nearly forgotten his beating, but very much enjoyed the petting. Having done all these and many other things, Mrs. Jenkins sat down to get up the real lace cap. Every thread was pulled out separately and carefully stretched, when, what was that? Outside in the street, a chorus of piping children's voices sang the old carol she had heard a hundred times in the days of her youth. As Joseph was a walking, he heard an angel sing, This night shall be born our heavenly King. He neither shall be born in housen nor in hall, nor in the place of paradise, but in an ox's stool. He neither shall be clothed in purple nor in pall, but all in fair linen, as were babies all. He neither shall be rocked in silver nor in gold, but in a wooden cradle that rocks on the She got up and went to the window. There below stood the group of grey-black little figures, relieved against the snow, which now enveloped everything. For old sake's sake, as she phrased it, she counted out a halfpenny a piece for the singers out of the copper bag, and threw them down below. The room had become chilly while she had been counting out and throwing down her money, so she stirred her already glowing fire and sat down right before it, but not to stretch her lace. Like Mary Hodgson, she began to think over long past days, on softening remembrances of the dead and gone, on words long forgotten, on holy stories heard at her mother's knee. "'I cannot think what's come over me to-night,' said she half aloud, recovering herself by the sound of her own voice from her train of thought. "'My head goes wandering on them old times. I'm sure more texts have come into my head with thinking on my mother within this last half-hour than I've thought on for years and years. I hope I'm not going to die. Folks say thinking too much on the dead betokens we're going to join em. I should be loath to go just yet.' Such a fine turkey as we've got for dinner to-morrow, too. Knock, knock, knock at the door, as fast as knuckles could go. And then, as if the comer could not wait, the door was opened, and Mary Hodgson stood there as white as death. Mrs. Jenkins, oh, your kettle is boiling, thank God. Let me have the water for my baby, for the love of God. He's got croup and is dying. Mrs. Jenkins turned on her chair with a wooden, inflexible look on her face that, between ourselves, her husband knew and dreaded for all his pompous dignity. "'I'm sorry I can't oblige you, ma'am. My kettle is wanted for my husband's tea. Don't be afeard, Tommy. Mrs. Hodgson won't venture to intrude herself where she's not desired.' "'You'd better send for the doctor, ma'am, instead of wasting your time in wringing your hands, ma'am. My kettle is engaged.' Mary clasped her hands together with passionate force, 
but spoke no word of entreaty to that wooden face, that sharp, determined voice. But as she turned away, she prayed for strength to bear the coming trial, and strength to forgive Mrs. Jenkins. Mrs. Jenkins watched her go away meekly as one who has no hope, and then she turned upon herself as sharply as she ever did on any one else. "'What a brute I am! Lord, forgive me! What's my husband's tea to a baby's life? In croup, too, where time is everything. You crabbed old vixen, you! Any one may know you never had a child!' She was downstairs, kettle in hand, before she had finished her self-upbraiding, and when in Mrs. Hodgson's room she rejected all thanks, Mary had not the voice for many words, saying stiffly, "'I do it for the poor babby's sake, ma'am, hoping he may live to have mercy to poor dumb beasts, if he does forget to lock his cupboards.' But she did everything— and more than Mary, with her young inexperience, could have thought of. She prepared the warm bath, and tried it with her husband's own thermometer. Mr. Jenkins was as punctual as clockwork in noting down the temperature of every day. She let his mother place her baby in the tub, still preserving the same rigid, affronted aspect, and then she went upstairs without a word. Mary longed to ask her to stay, but dared not, though when she left the room the tears chased each other down her cheeks faster than ever. Poor young mother! How she counted the minutes till the doctor should come! But before he came, down again stalked Mrs. Jenkins with something in her hand. "'I've seen many of these croup fits, which I take it you've not, ma'am. Mustard plasters is very sovereign put on the throat. I've been up and made one, ma'am, and by your leave I'll put it on the poor little fellow.' Mary could not speak, but she signed her grateful assent. It began to smart while they still kept silence, and he looked up to his mother as if seeking courage from her looks to bear the stinging pain, but she was softly crying to see him suffer, and her want of courage reacted upon him, and he began to sob aloud. Instantly Mrs. Jenkins' apron was up, hiding her face. Peepo, baby, said she as merrily as she could. His little face brightened and his mother having once got the cue, the two women kept the little fellow amused until his plaster had taken effect. "'He's better! Oh, Mrs. Jenkins, look at his eyes! How different! And he breathes quite softly!' As Mary spoke thus, the doctor entered. He examined his patient. Baby was really better. "'It has been a sharp attack. But the remedies you have applied have been worth all the pharmacopoeia an hour later. I shall send a powder, etc., etc. Mrs. Jenkins stayed to hear this opinion, and, her heart wonderfully more easy, was going to leave the room when Mary seized her hand and kissed it. She could not speak her gratitude. Mrs. Jenkins looked affronted and awkward, and as if she must go upstairs and wash her hand directly. But in spite of these sour looks, she came softly down an hour or so afterwards to see how baby was. The little gentleman slept well after the fright he had given his friends, and on Christmas morning, when Mary awoke and looked at the sweet little pale face lying on her arm, she could hardly realise the danger he had been in. When she came down, later than usual, she found the household in a commotion. What do you think had happened? Why, Pussy had been a traitor to his best friend— and eaten up some of Mr. Jenkins' own especial sausages, 
and gnawed and tumbled the rest so that they were not fit to be eaten there were no bounds to that cat's appetite he would have eaten his own father if he had been tender enough and now mrs jenkins stormed and cried hang the cat christmas day too and all the shops shut what was turkey without sausages gruffly asked mr jenkins oh jem whispered mary hearken what a piece of work he's making about sausages i should like to take mrs jenkins up some of mother's they're twice as good as bought sausages i see no objection my dear sausages do not involve intimacies elsie's politics are what i can no ways respect but old jem if you had seen her last night about baby i'm sure she may scold me for ever and i'll not answer i'd even make her cat welcome to the sausages the tears gathered to mary's eyes as she kissed her boy better take em upstairs my dear and give em to the cat's mistress and jem chuckled at his saying mary put them on a plate but still she loitered what must i say jem i never know say i hope you'll accept of these sausages as my mother no that's not grammar say what comes uppermost mary it will be sure to be right so mary carried them upstairs and knocked at the door and when told to come in she looked very red but went up to mrs jenkins saying please take these mother made them and was away before an answer could be given just as hodgson was ready to go to church mrs jenkins came downstairs and called fanny in a minute the latter entered the hodgson's room and delivered mr and mrs jenkins compliments and they would be particular glad if mr and mrs hodgson would eat their dinner with them and carry baby upstairs in a shawl be sure added mrs jenkins voice in the passage close to the door whither she had followed her messenger there was no discussing the matter with the certainty of every word being overheard mary looked anxiously at her husband she remembered his saying he did not approve of mr jenkins politics do you think it would do for baby asked he oh yes answered she eagerly i would wrap him up so warm and i've got our room up to sixty-five already for all it's so frosty added the voice outside now how do you think they settled the matter the very best way in the world mr and mrs jenkins came down into the hodgson's room and dined there turkey at the top roast beef at the bottom sausages at one side potatoes at the other second course plum pudding at the top and mince pies at the bottom and after dinner mrs jenkins would have baby on her knee and he seemed quite to take to her she declared he was admiring the real lace on her cap but mary thought though she did not say so that he was pleased by her kind looks and coaxing words then he was wrapped up and carried carefully upstairs to tea in mrs jenkins's room and after tea mrs jenkins and mary and her husband found out each other's mutual liking for music and sat singing old glees and catches till i don't know what o'clock without one word of politics or newspapers before they parted mary had coaxed pussy on to her knee for mrs jenkins would not part with baby who was sleeping on her lap when you're busy bring him to me do now it will be a real favour i know you must have a deal to do with another coming let him come up to me i'll take the greatest of cares of him pretty darling how sweet he looks when he's asleep when the couples were once more alone 
the husbands unburdened their minds to their wives mr jenkins said to his do you know burgess tried to make me believe hodgson was such a fool as to put paragraphs into the examiner now and then but i see he knows his place and has got too much sense to do any such thing hodgson said mary love i almost fancy from jenkins way of speaking so much civiler than i expected he guesses i wrote that pro bono and the rosebud at any rate i've no objection to your naming it if the subject should come uppermost i should like him to know i'm a literary man well i've ended my tale i hope you don't think it too long but before i go just let me say one thing if any of you have any quarrels or misunderstandings or coolnesses or cold shoulders or shynesses or tiffs or miffs or huffs with any one else just make friends before christmas you will be so much merrier if you do i ask it of you for the sake of that old angelic song heard so many years ago by the shepherds keeping watch by night on bethlehem heights end of christmas storms and sunshine by mrs gaskell recording by ruth golding if you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.